So welcome everybody to challenge number three of Organization Boot Camp, sort of the short, sweet, and intense um, version of the program today. So, um, and this is Tiffany Spaulding talking to you. Now, if you're new to the webinar, you will not um, hear my voice. I mean, you'll hear my voice, but you won't um, actually be able to. Um, you actually won't be able to see me. You just see my screen, and you hear me talking, and um, uh, and that's it. So. If you have questions, I'm sorry, I'm in a new environment. I don't usually, I'm down in Bend. I almost always broadcast either from my home or the office in Tacoma. And so it's kind of a weird, I'm having a hard time settling in and getting focused here. So um, so this is challenge number three. You can't see me. You can just hear my voice if you're new. You do have a question box. So if you think of questions as we go along, feel free to type them into the question pane. And um, I don't actually see them until the end of the webinar, but then I'll answer them at the end. There's a chance that I may have answered them already um, during the webinar, but I'll answer them. I'll just recap them when we get to the end. Sorry, I'm, I'll try to stay a little bit more focused here. So um, we usually have a winner every week, and I will confess to you that I have been in the car for the last six hours driving down here, and I did not pull a winning name from um, all the progress posts. So I'll put the winner up on Facebook and email the winner um, e via email or Facebook. Um, as soon as this is over, I'll do the drawing and I'll post the winner. But I'm sorry that I didn't do that. I just didn't have access to the Internet while I was in the car driving. And then I um, totally forgot about it. So I will get a winner chosen and we'll get it announced on Facebook right after that challenge tonight. So let's get started. Our goals for this webinar are to establish a system for sorting, storing, and organizing Things like stamps and punches and cutting systems. So whether when I say cutting system, that might be a, a cuddle bug or a, a cricket or um, any other kind of quick cuts or anything like that. So what we're really going to talk about today is how do you take things that are bulky and that won't actually fit into your scrap rack or into your Ziploc bag or file folder and make them work in your organization system. And so what really is important at this point is the foundation that we've established for getting organized and starting to think about things systematically rather than as individual things. So what we're going to talk about is incorporating um, those things or um, a representation of those things into your organization system. So there's a lot of challenges that come with this kind of stuff. It's bulky, it's a different shape, it might have some other kind of packaging that we want to keep for some reason. So there's a whole bunch of different reasons that it's hard to um, incorporate them into your system when you're thinking about file folders or Ziploc bags or something like that. But what we're going to do is use that representation and we're going to work it right into the system. We might just have to store it separately from the other things. Now, one of the other challenges with organizing this stuff is whether you're a got a little or a got a lot. And you got a lot, or you know who you are. Um, got a littles have a few, a little variety of different things. If you're a got a little, you like to, the stuff you have, but you're not likely to accumulate large amounts of anything. You're more likely to use products that are available to you at your local scrapbook store when you go to a crop fair or when you go to some other event. Got a lot love, 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 love all these fun toys and feel almost a collector. If you're a god a lot, you're very likely to continue to add to your collection. Your cropping pals probably rely on you to have a huge variety of tools and toys to share. And so part of the joy for you is that not only do you get to use these tools and toys, but you get to share them with your friends and your cropping pals as well. So there's kind of the two ends of the spectrum. And then there's the people who are somewhere in the middle. You can choose to use either, if you're someone in the middle, you can choose to either use the got a little system or the got a lot system. Maybe you're going to mix it up a little bit. But the most important thing is to set yourself up for success. So if you're a got a little right now because you're just getting started, but you could really see or you could totally get into stamps or um, spellbinders dies or punches or something like that, then you want to set yourself up as a got a lot if you're going to go that direction. Some of you are kind of in the middle right now and you're thinking, I really don't want all this stuff. I'm going to pare down and I'm going to use, you know, my girlfriend's stuff. I'm going to use this stuff when we go to crops or whatever that's provided there. So kind of take stock of who you are and how you're going to move forward with your hobby to be able to choose which method you want to use. We're going to talk about both of them today, though. So, 
So Gato Littles are going to integrate product representations and in some cases the actual products right into their four section system. And lots, you're going to create a standalone catalog that you're going to keep with your four section system and integrate into your four section system. Some people will create two catalogs, one to be right in their four section system and one that's a total standalone catalog. So those are some options for you. We'll talk more in depth about them as we go along. So with Gato Littles, we're going to talk about representations of things. So um, if you're Gato Little, you're going to create representations of products. So let's do this um, little gift box stamp as an example. So this stamp could fit in a number of categories. Some of the examples, birthday, Christmas, Hanukkah, wedding, baby, blah, 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 six categories. So you're going to take that little um, Christmas or that gift box stamp, and you're going to stamp it out six Times, once for every category that you think it's going to belong in. And then you can see that this stamp is number 15, which means it's in a drawer that's labeled 1 through 25. So I'm going to write the number 15 next to all these little impressions of the stamp, and then I'm going to cut out those stamps, and I'm going to drop one little impression into birthday, one into Christmas, one into baby, wedding, etc. So now when I'm creating something, as I flip, I'm working on a wedding card or whatever, I can go to wedding. And I'll see that little gift box stamp impression and remember that I have the stamp and know that it's stamp number 15, so it's going to be in the drawer labeled 1 through 25. So I'm going to get more in uh, depth and we'll show you some pictures of how that all works too. But basically what you're doing with, with something like a woodblock stamp is labeling it with a number and um, putting it everywhere so that you'll remember that you have it and then it's easy to find and easy to use. And one of the nice things about this is if you go to a crop or something, and let's say you're working on baby pages, and you take that baby section with you, and then you see, oh, that little gift box stamp would be perfect for the baby shower. Um, you don't actually have to take the stamp and the inks and the embossing powders and all that stuff with you. You have the stamp. You, you can see what size it is. Um, if you actually cut out around the edges of the stamp, and you can actually lay that little impression on your what you're working on at the crop and see how it's going to line up, and then just take a sticky note and write, you know, use stamp number 15 here when I get home. And that way you're getting the most use out of your stamp, but you don't have to haul everything with you when you go to a crop or an event. So that's going to work regardless if you're got a lot, you're going to be able to apply that strategy um, either way. So with got a little, so we're going to number the stamp or the die cut or the punch. We're going to write the number, in this case, the stamp number on the impressions. Separate the impressions and put them into each category where they belong. And then we're going to store the stamp die cut, punch, whatever it is in its proper place. So here's kind of some examples of a kit from that kind of, these are examples of a Stampin' Up! kit, and it's for me it's Stampin' Up! kit number five. And so each of the woodblock stamps is marked SU5, and I kept them all together. Even though, and I photocopied them, and you could photocopy multiples of them. So even though I might use them in different places, so the chef I might put under birthday, I'm just going to put that impression of him and write SU5. And Bon Appetit, that might be um, in birthday, it might be in wedding, it might be in Christmas or Thanksgiving, any type of celebration. I might even put it in travel. But I'm going to make as many copies of it and put it wherever it would go. So I'm going to keep that whole Stampin' Up! set together as SU5. So whether I use just the chef or the whole set to do as it is wine, cheese, birthday, whatever, it's all going to be kept together in one place. So. Why are we numbering? Numbering things like stamps, punches, cricket, et cetera, prevent constantly rearranging to fit like products into the correct area. Numbering allows you fast, easy access when you need to find something, and also it makes it really easy to put things back in the proper place. So what I mean by that is, let's talk about woodblock stamps. Right? So traditionally, we, we store our woodblock stamps um, by putting all of our baby stamps together and then all of our beach stamps together on the next shelf or in the next drawer down, followed up by birthday stamps. Well, if your beach stamp drawer or shelf is full and you buy a new beach stamp, then you're caught in this conundrum of do I rearrange baby or do I rearrange birthday? How do I keep all these beach stamps together? And so you're constantly rearranging to try and work things in to where they should go. Well, once you switch to cataloging them, and we're going to see a catalog as well as the representations as we go through, then it doesn't matter anymore that they're not um, in order by theme because you're going to have a catalog page 
for baby and for beach and for birthday. And if your catalog page for beach is full, you're just going to add another page and put it right in order with beach. You're going to stamp that new beach stamp on the page. If you have 275 stamps, this new beach stamp is going to be stamp number 276. You're going to write 276 next to the impression, 276 on the stamp. Now, with my woodblock stamps, and I don't have a lot of them, I'm, and I'm actually sort of moving away from them. I'm, I need to take the ones that I do have off the blocks. I think that's becoming more and more common. But um, um, you, if I wrote on all four sides and the top of the stamp, so no matter how I put the stamp in the drawer, the edge that every edge has a number on it, so it'll be easy to find. So um, then I'm going to label that stamp, go back to the beach stamp 276. I'm going to go to the last drawer or shelf or box or whatever I've got, and it might be labeled 250 and then just a line because it's not full yet. And I'm going to put that 276 in there right next to 275, and so it'll be easy for me to find. So the numbering thing is really how you avoid organizing and reorganizing stamps by theme or category or holiday or event. You use the cataloging system. The other thing about this is, even if you if you think about putting all your beach stamps together in one drawer, you can't see them all. You have to constantly dig through them. You're not really sure what size they are. Um, so having that catalog available, not only does it tell you what size they are, but you can really see all the different choices. So you might think to yourself, I want to use that be a beach ball stamp. And you go into your stamp drawer and you pull out a beach ball and you think, I'm going to use this. But if you had a catalog, you may have seen that you have three different sizes of beach ball, and that would have been a cuter, maybe a little collage of stamps, or a smaller beach ball would have been better, and you didn't, forgot that you had it, so you had to use the bigger one, or whatever. There's all those different scenarios, because when you're relying on your brain, especially stampers who have hundreds, if not thousands of stamps, it's hard to remember exactly what you've got. So building that catalog is going to be helpful, or making those impressions is going to be helpful, because you're going to see exactly what you've got. So got a lot are going to create a catalog, label, and store. So creating a catalog that's an actual standalone catalog of your stuff is the way to go for your got a lot. Your catalog is going to follow your four-section system. It's actually only three sections because there's really no rainbow in it. But the catalog can easily be transported to crops or classes or even on shopping trips. You'll buy product that complement rather than duplicate what you already own. So especially if you like to go to Stampin' Up! or Close to My Heart events, and you, if you can't bring all of your stamps with you, and check to make sure you haven't already bought that particular stamp set or something very similar to it, um, you end up with things that either don't match what you thought they would match or they're duplicates. But having a catalog allows you to take that um, whole catalog with you to any kind of event so you're buying the stuff that you need rather than stuff that duplicates that you've already got. So a couple different ways to do a catalog. You can either use a 12 by 12 format or an 8 half by 11 format. Um, 12 by 12 allows you to put more stamps on a page. 8 and half by 11 is a little bit easier to transport around, so you can just choose there. In either case, you're going to need a paper, page protectors, hole reinforcers possibly, and some sort of tab divider. Um, then you're going to gather all those things together. So if you're a got a little, you should bring all of your stuff together at the same time and just sort of work through it, whether it's mixed together in totes or whatever. But if you've got a lot, you might want to start with just one type of product because you may need to um, code things a little bit differently if you've got a lot. And we'll talk a little bit about coding di the different things from stamp sets to anonymous stamps and that type of thing. So you have to decide how you're going to store these items. So again, this is going back to that organized only space and preparing that organized only space. So where are you going to store them? Are they going to go in boxes, bins, drawers, totes? shelves, um, if they're acrylic stamps, they could go in um, scrap rack pages. If there's the spell binders, they could go in scrap rack pages. So how are you going to store these different things? You kind of have to have a handle on that before you get started. Um, and then when I, here's what I was mentioning about code lists. So you might have several different kinds of stamps if you're a got a lot. And so you're going to have your woodblock stamps and your woodblock kit stamps maybe in different places. So I'm not a big advocate for re, um, recreating things or reinventing things that you don't need to. So if we're talking about Stampin' Up! sets that are already in the plastic clamshell from Stampin' Up!, I just, and there's some pictures coming up, I left them in that and just numbered them and stood them up in a basket. I'm going to really recommend that you stand them up. If you're using the clamshells and you're stacking them, then that means you have to 
you know, pull things out of the bottom to find them or whatever. So it's a lot better if you can just kind of stand them on their edge, almost like a book. And um, that will make it easier to pull them in and out. And if it's easier, we'll use them. We know that. So keep it simple on yourself. Find a way to stand them up. If you don't have a lot, I don't have a lot of them. You'll see my basket in the next couple pictures. But, um, but just different ways to label what they are. And this is um, important, too, if you're stamping up rep or a close to my heart rep because you want to keep your close to my heart or stamping up stuff separate from your other stuff so that when you're using it to teach a class for your company, you know that you're using, you know that you have just the right products to do or whatever. So, and then there's different things, physics, cricket, punches, punch kits, and all those type of things that you might want to label in your catalog. So starting the process, if you're a god a lot, it means you're going to go through one container at a time, stamping, punch, copying. When I say copying, you saw this, my stamp. I put them on a copy machine and just ran, you know, just photocopy them and then either cut them apart or did the whole sets together depending on where they were going in which category. And the reason I did that was because then I didn't have to clean all the stamps. So some of you, depending on your uh, how fast your copy machine is, because if your copy machine doesn't run fast, which when I first tried to do it, I was using a slow copy machine at home and took forever. Um, so if you or, or if you just want to stamp them all out to get really that stamp detail, um, either way, I mean you can do it either way, but that's what it means copying. Now you could also do them. Um, you can also scan them uh, on your scanner and not print. Not uh, and and then you have the. You can do a digital catalog. We I did a presentation on using um, OneNote to organize digital information, and so you could put it in there, or you could also print it out. The problem with scanning things or taking pictures of things, even more so with the photograph, is knowing exactly what size they are. So if you're scanning or taking pictures of them, you know, with the scan you have an option to make it smaller and fit more on the page. With pictures, obviously, you know, you can take a stamp and blow it up to fill an entire eight and a half by eleven piece of paper. So if you just put some sort of ruler or or um, you, even your twelve by twelve cutting mat with the grid lines on it and take pictures of the stamps that way, that way you know how actually big those stamps are. So that when you're looking at them digitally you know that it's two inches long or whatever as well. Um, and then when you're finished, you're going to label your containers uh, where you sort of then catalog the items with the numbers for each item. So if you put 50 stamps in the first box, it's going to be 1 through 50. In the second box, 51 through 100 or however that works out. So here's what those catalogs might look like in two different ways here. So the catalog on the left and the back on the yellow background is actually a 12 by 12 sheet of paper with photocopied stamps. Now the numbers next to each of the images in this picture represents where I can find them. So this this stamp, this animal catalog or these stamps are all unmounted stamps. They're all in scrap rack storage pages and the numbers in the beginning indicate what pocket configuration they are. So when you look at the bottom ones, it's, uh, pocket number is 6102 and 6101. So my tabs, and you'll see them come up, are labeled with the sizes of the pocket and so these are going to all be behind tab number six. And that just helps me use fill pockets economically. So I'm putting all the medium stamps in the six page and all like the close to my heart stamps are then in the four page. So you'll see some more examples of that. It's kind of hard to visualize, I think. And then the picture on the um, right side is a catalog of actually punched out stamps and punches. And so this follows along with the four section system. This is the beach page that we're looking at. Maybe the vacation page. I think this is beach. I think in this catalog vacation, um, ocean. It's ocean, I guess. So, um, so it's got all those different things for the ocean. And then if you go, went under the V tab for vacation, you'd also see the palm tree there because the palm tree would work for anything that's in vacation or also anything that was in beach. And if there was a nature section, then I would also have that palm tree under nature as well. I'm going to pause to take a drink here for a second. Okay, so here's what I was talking about, about how those tabs are labeled. So the very front section is the stamp catalog, and so I did my catalog in 12 by 12, on 12 by 12 sheets of paper. I used supersized singles as the page protectors. Now you don't necessarily need to use the page protector um, for the supersized single. You could three-hole punch your, your 12 by 12 piece of paper 
and just use hold reinforcers on it and then just put them in that way. There's no reason to have them in a page protector. Um, it was just convenient and easy for me to do it that way. Um, and then and then the same thing, because it's three-hole punch, if I added another alphabet section, I, my alphabet page is full, I can just insert it in. So keep that in mind if you're using a three-ring system that you want to put your pages in in such a way, like what I'm saying is you don't want to put baby on the front of a page and then use the back side of that 12 by 12 cardstock for um, beach because once your baby page is full, there's going to be no way to separate it out from, from beach, if that makes sense. So do just one sheet for each thing and then you'll be able to add to it as you go along. And so each of the tabs represented. So if you pulled this tab number six, in pocket number 101 is where you would find that first stamp. I think it was 101. It might be 102. Let's go quick back. So in pocket number 101, you would find this basic gray, this little bird stamp. In pocket number 102, behind the six tab, you would find that tab, the um, one that's labeled 6102. So just that's what the number, how the numbering system goes. And it's a little cumbersome. Once you start using it, when you're talking about then making those um, using those pockets economically so that you're filling the pockets all the way full instead of bounce. You don't want to bounce back and forth between pockets with numbering. You want to number your pockets first. I think there's an example of that here. So um, so here's that page again. But And then here's some pockets number. This is the Sweet 16 page, perfect page for those little $1 acrylic stamps. But I went through and I numbered all the pockets first. Now, I used a half of a file folder label to number the pockets. You can just, if you want, you can just take a Sharpie and write right on the plastic. The reason that I use this sticker uh, on it is because when you write on the plastic and then you start, it's, since it's clear, once you start loading things behind it, it's a little bit more difficult to read. Um, but there's no reason you can't write directly on the plastic. So I numbered all my pockets first. And then I put the stamps in and numbered the stamps. And that way I was able to fill entire sheets of, you know, sweet 16 pages or perfect six pages or whatever with the right size stamp. I didn't have to skip around. I don't know if that makes sense. Too. That's kind of a confusing thing. So here's those Stampin' Up or Close to My Heart stamps. And you can see in the Stampin' Up basket one through nine, I have nine clamshells of Stampin' Up stamps. And again, I just took a file folder tab, label tab, stuck it on the Close to My Heart clamshell, wrote the name and whatever number I had given it and put it on there. And so the same thing was close to my heart. If you're leaving your stamps in those little um, the little plastic pockets, I just put a, another thing like another file folder label on it so it's bigger <laughs> because I'm over 40 and I don't always have my glasses available. And so I put the sticker on the front and then I <laughs> wrote the number of the set big on the front of that as well. And then I could keep them in numerical order that way also. So another option is to use a photo storage box and photo files if you're looking for a way to store flatter things like um, unmounted stamps, um, uh, nestabilities or cell binders or embossing folders. So you're just going to use that photo storage box and the file folders and mark on the file folders the numbers of what the things are in there and then just put them in numerical order and then you just put a little number tab in the front of the file folder. So you're still going to want to stay in that four section system. Um, and just number your photo file boxes the same way. So I'm sure I don't have a picture up of that. So when we talk about Cricut cartridges, they're a big challenge, right, because well, there's all these different things you can store them in, and some people like to keep their boxes, and some people don't want to keep their boxes. So there's a couple of different options, um, but they all kind of go back to that same sort of numbering system. So the picture on the left is called, uh, I don't know what it's called, actually, what the real name is, and I think it's called the Cricut Cartridge Storage Box. Um, it's available at most art stores. We used to carry them on our website. We don't anymore, but usually Michael's or Joanna's going to have them. Um, they're plastic. They're, they're stackable, which is nice. They don't have any kind of handle on them, which is kind of the flaw in the design for them. Um, but they'll hold 16 cartridges and 16 booklets and overlays, and then there's even a little, like a little tool slot in the front there. And so the key with this um, particular system is that you're just going to number your cartridges and you're also going to number the um, box so you know exactly where in the which box. So if you take a cartridge out of box number two, which would be 17 through 32, 
and you have cartridge number 18, you know exactly where to put that cartridge back or get the book and overlay if you need it. So you've got that way to store them, that same number system. And then you're just going to take an impression. And I always use what was on the back of the box. Now, um, you can get better impressions of all the things each Cricut cartridge will do or each Cricut cartridge will make on the internet. If you're part of our Facebook group, um, if you, again, go to the Files tab on the Facebook group, people, we've, the, gals, the earlier gals have already done all the work for you. And so there's links and images and information about which websites are better. But you can go and download that Cricut cartridge, everything that it'll do, print it out. So if you have a Christmas Cricut cartridge, you're going to print it out, that cartridge image, and put it in your Christmas section and just write the number of the Cricut cartridge on the little printout. So if that Christmas cartridge is number 30, then you know you can go to the box labeled 17 through 32, open it up, go to slot number 30, pull it out, pull out the book and the overlay, and use it. So you can really condense down your Cricut cartridges and putting them all into a book, I mean into a box, rather than having the... Um, having all the boxes out or having to cart all the boxes around. Now, some people I know keep their boxes. Um, I have one gal who keeps her boxes and just all up in the attic because they're a pain to work with, but she's worried that if she ever wants to sell this cartridge, she thinks the book will be important. So you might keep that in mind as well. Now, the other thing is that um, there's a foreign language section in the booklet. And um, if you can pull, if you don't need the foreign language section, if you can pull that out of the booklet, then you will have a little bit more space to work with. It's a little bit of a tight squeeze in that box at the book list if they have all the languages in them. So, and then we also make this actually a scrap brand product is the cutting cartridge storage page. And this will hold two cartridges, two in each of the little square pockets. There's only one shown here, but it will actually hold two. Two booklets and two overlays in a long, narrow pocket. So you can actually get um, 12 uh, cartridges, booklets, and overlays in a page. The page is double-sided. So if you want to store them that way, either in a travel pack or just on a binder, maybe in a drawer, or right on your strap rack, those are all options for doing that as well. And you can really load them up. They're a thick, they have a very thick, sensitive pocket in them. Um, so here's a picture of it doubled up, so you can kind of see how that works. So there's plenty of room you can see for both cartridges and the booklets and overlays. The other nice thing about this um, Cricut cartridge page is that um, if, if you leave one empty, and if you saw the blog post I did this summer about scrapbooking while I was on vacation, I actually loaded up one of the um, Cricut cartridge pages with inks and chalks and pens and really bulky stuff like some wire and washi tape and that kind of stuff. Um, so I could take it with me when I went. I just took a travel pack with us when we went for a week to Moab, Utah. I tried to pre-plan um, pages, or not really pages, but I tried to take things like we were mountain biking. So I took our, my mountain biking stuff, whitewater rafting, um, whatever, hiking stuff. So I put individual sections in the project planner page, and then I took one of these pages, loaded up kind of the bulky stuff, because all I took was one travel pack. So And then I scrapbooked while we were actually on vacation. So if we did mountain biking today, I went I printed the pictures at the you know, uh, drugstore and tried to stop as the vacation happened. And I was marginally successful. I was not as successful as I was, but this, um, keeping one of these Cricut cartridge pages empty is a great way to throw those sort of loose, bulky things into a container and throw them in your travel pack, your tote, and take them to an event with you and have them all sort of handy when you need them. So here's another um, great way to organize your uh, Cricut cart. This gal just took a divider, <clears throat> put bands of Velcro on the divider, put dots of Velcro on the back of each cartridge. Same thing. You number the cartridges, number the divider, and then you have all the cartridges together in one place. And you can take your little booklets in a tote, or you can just take the um, and you want to take all the booklets in your little tote, or you can just take the cartridges that you need if you're working on just grab your Christmas cartridges and your Christmas booklets, and then head out the door. But the Velcro was a great way to a lot of stuff in a small space, and it's very visible and very accessible. It's another thing about keeping your cartridges and booklets in the box. You have to get the box, you have to get the box open, you have to get everything in the box, and then you have to put everything back in the box. Well, if it's easy, you'll do it, and if it's difficult, you won't do it as much. So this is a system here that made it really easy to have everything at your fingertips. 
If you do want to keep everything in the box, it's fine. Um, and But again, when you line them up on the shelf, now this gal has two different, she has the um, Cricut um, Alphabet and Cricut, um, I want to say, oh, themed. <laughs> I was going to say icons, but and Cricut themed. But she's given them a number and then made the copy. Like So this is CA 101, Cricut Alphabet 101. She's going to put that little printing thing that you see on the front under alphabet. Also probably put it, or I would put it under school because it looks like a school alphabet or back to school or whatever. So again, you want to put as many representations of those things as you would actually use them. So, but it's CA 101. It's going to be in school. It's going to be an alphabet. And then all her alphabet boxes are together. When she gets a new alphabet box, it becomes CA-10 whatever it would be. Here she's got seven, so CA-108. And then she'll just file a copy of the alphabet in each of the sections where it might belong. And then the same thing with the theme. So Cricut themes. So, you know, she's got Locker Talk, which is probably also back to school, and um, uh, Beyond Birthday. So that's going to be under B for Birthday. But there might be some other things in there that might go under Celebration or whatever. But um, I'm sure you're kind of getting the point now. You're just adding those things together and putting them somewhere where you remember that you have them and then you'll actually use them as opposed to just forgetting about them until you're done. So it's kind of hard to see these stamp and punch drawers here that are numbered, but the numbers on the drawer coincide with the numbers on the catalog that's shown in the bottom. So if I wanted to use that butterfly um, punch, I could just go to drawer number 11, which is where the butterfly punches are stored, open drawer number 11, and that's where I would find all those butterfly punches. And when I'm done with it, I can just put the punch away in the drawer where I got it from. And so if you write on the punch also 11 or 11, so you know if it was in drawer 11, you don't know exactly where to put it. You don't have to go scan through left. So when this project first started, this gal put an example of each of the punches that was in the drawer right on the front. But you can see how, as that started, it was probably all neat and tidy and easy to read. And then as the drawers filled up, you know, things got kind of crowded together. So it's hard to see exactly what was in there. So doing the catalog makes it easy to go right to the things that you need and get to those products. One of the big things you need to remember is that you want to start a catalog page, even if you only have one thing that fits that category. So the same thing we talked about is you were organizing your supplies or your embellishments or whatever, that if you, in fact, came across a soccer embellishment and you thought, oh, I don't have any other sports things right now. I'm just going to set this over here at the end of the table. I'll worry about it later. You want to avoid doing that. So if you have, in this case, one golf stamp, start a section called sports, put that golf stamp on the sports section, give it a number, and put it in a drawer. And that way, as you buy more sports stuff or golf stuff or whatever it is, it's all going to be together. You will have already started it. You know, if you've already started that category, it makes it a lot easier to keep putting things away as you come across them. It's that sense of being overwhelmed and not knowing where things are going to go that that gives us reason to put it in a different drawer or put it in the closet and not worry about it or pile it up somewhere else. So the beautiful thing about the four-section system is whether something is new, whether it's something you just found, you know, buried in a pile, or whether it's something you've been using and you're ready to put away, that four-section system makes it really easy because you always know where it's going to go. You don't have to guess. So new stuff comes in the house, and you know exactly if you bought a Christmas sticker at the scrapbook store, when you get home, you know exactly where that Christmas sticker is going to go. If you use Christmas stuff, you know exactly where to put it away when you're So it really does make it simple once you have that four-section system dialed in. So you can do the same thing with things like <clears throat> embossing folders. Make examples of them. You might just have a page or two or four, however many um, embossing folders you've got. That's all the full-size embossing folders, and then they're just numbered in that embossing folder section. And then you can put ones that are specialty things, or, you, or we have this one that's music notes. So music notes, I would put an example of that in the section in, in my scrap rack that's called special occasion. I would put it in probably in the school section because the kids that are in band and choir and those kind of things. Um, if you, you might have a music section if your family's really musical. And then I would have it right there in just that example of embossing folders. Now I know also some people have a section in their um, themes category that's just called background. And so things like this that are really kind of generic backgrounds 
we're going to go in that an example will go in that section as well. So even you know we have the stamps <clears throat> that are just background stamps. They're swirls and dots and stripes and all those kinds. But they're just generic backgrounds. So they would go in there as well. You might also have a section um, in your themes again under B for borders. So if you've got your border um, punches or your border die cut, um, uh, like spellbinders, borders, or those kinds of things, or if you have those really cool creative memories, um, ones that, where you kind of hook the different stamps or different punches in and to create a big border, um, any of those. So that gives you a, a place for things that are just generic shapes um, to go in the border section or in the background section. Same thing with stamp punches that are, again, generic shapes, stars, hearts, squares, I think I have some chevrons, those kind of things. So you might have a section also that's just labeled shapes. You can put an example of all those shapes, circles, whatever they are, tags, that kind of thing, all in that one section that's just labeled shapes. So you have a place to look for those types of things as well. Um, and so here are the little, the little cuddle bug embossing folders as well. But just giving them a number and giving them a home is going to make it a lot easier to find what you need when you need it. And again, when you buy something new, if you buy a new spellbinder side or a new punch or something like that, you know exactly where to put it to catalog it and you know exactly where, what number to give it and how to put it away. It just makes it really simple. So one thing I didn't mention about the spellbinder dies is um, that if you're using a scrap you can just take a piece of magnetic cloth, and you can get that at Michael's in the general craft section, or Joanne in general craft. But you can also buy it on the internet. It's, um, it's called um, magnetic vent covers, is what they're called. It's a thin sheet of very flexible magnets. And you just cut it to the size of the pocket. And then just take your nestability size and just let them stick right on there to the magnet and slide the magnet sheet right into the pocket. And you'll be able to actually store those nestability dies on the magnetic sheet, um, and, but they'll be visible and they'll be accessible and you can get them categorized or numbered that way as well. Okay, and there is a video on the website. Um, so let me just, I'm going to pop up the website really quickly here and, um, <clears throat> and find that. Um, I'm going to take my little shortcut over here. Okay, so if you go into the Learn tab and then scroll down, it says Nest Abilities, organize them in your scrap rack. So I didn't have any pictures of that, but this is what it looks like. So there's just really step-by-step -step instructions, and they're in a little video for those of you who prefer the videos, well, um, so you can see it in action. So this just tells you how to measure um, the dies out and put them, you know, kind of get the most economical you can on that cloth and then fit them into um, pocket pages. So that information is there as well. <clears throat> so the 2013 Results Get Organized Challenge page is done, but there's not an actual sign up for the webinar yet. But I'll send out a link to this page. And when you click on this Register Now button, you can right to the webinar page. You're just going to get to a email to a part that looks this in that case, and um, then you'll sign up for this email list. And as soon as we have a what system we're going to be using, you'll get another email with a link to the actual what you're used to for the registration page. So that is available too, and I'll get it. I'll get it put out on Facebook today, and also get it put out um, in the follow-up. The two things I'm going to do for you on Facebook today are um, post the winner and um, and I'll send you that link as well to that. So to so this week's challenge. So catalog 20 things a day for the next seven days. It's 140 items over the course of the next week. Ooh, that's a big challenge. Um, now you can continue through the process by doing a little each week until everything is cataloged. Or you can catalog things as you use them. Or you can do both. Now there's a couple of ideas on this whole thing, or two schools of thought to catalog as you use. And the first is, if I didn't catalog it, that means I didn't use it. So I could probably get rid of it, right? So you think, if it's been a year and I haven't used that, I could probably get rid of it. But then the other school of thought is, now wait a minute. If it happened in my catalog and it popped up for me and I saw that I had it, then I probably would have used it. So 
whichever way you want to go, or maybe again, you just you want to keep a couple of those ideas, both of those ideas to some degree, but keep that in mind if you're trying to decide if it's something that you should keep or something that you should move on uh, or or send on to someone else. Um, there's a couple of different ways to consider. So what are the next steps? So um, join the 2013 Resolve to Get Organized Challenge, which starts in January. So if you need more motivation or more inspiration or more details or you just want to keep working through, I just want to stress the fact we have lots of doubts on the challenge a number of times. And the nice thing about this whole four system idea is you can just keep cruising along a little bit at a time doing, you know, four inches of paper, two boxes of stamps, whatever it is, every week. And if that being part of the group every week keeps you motivated and keeps you focused, we love to have you. And also makes you a great resource for people who are first timers through the challenge. And, and a lot of people get really overwhelmed. So here's a couple of tips and tricks. One, don't get overwhelmed. We've talked about this a little bit. So make sure you're doing things in small tasks, including this one, and finishing what you started um, before you have to put everything away so that you'll actually see that progress. Remember, it's not rocket science. If you make a mistake, if you put, if you don't put that gift box stamp in enough categories first time through, don't worry about it. Because if you think to yourself later, oh, I really should have put the gift box stamp under scouting because we give our scoutmaster a gift every year, you can always go back and make another impression of the stamp and add it in. So don't worry about it. Same like we talked a little bit about with sorting paper. If you make a couple of mistakes along the way, it's not going to matter. Things are going to come back up and you're going to be able to refer them. And then don't let your emotional brain take over. I guess that goes back a bit to getting frustrated and overwhelmed, right? So once you become exhausted, physically exhausted, tired of the task that you're doing, and for some people that's 20 minutes into it, and for some people it doesn't happen for 20 hours, so know yourself. But once you start to see those signs of exhaustion, your emotional brain is going to take over and you're going to stop making good decisions. So be ready to walk away at that point, whether it's 20 minutes or 20 hours. Later. And then, of course, there's so much more information on our website and the Facebook group. So I, you can always email us or call us. We're happy to answer questions at any time. So feel free to use all of those resources as you're moving through the holiday season and trying to get and stay organized. Okay, so I am going to open the question pane. Here. Let's see if I can find the navigation pane and pull it out again. Here we go. And I will answer questions here. I'm going to put my glasses back on for this one so I can read them. I can't get my pane to be big enough to read. There we go. Sorry for the black boxes. The black boxes are one of the reasons we're thinking of changing. Um, to a different uh, service that doesn't have those. So um, hopefully next year we'll be with a server that doesn't let those don't show up. So Leanne says, are you familiar with a scrapbooking case of hanging folders about 12 by 12 and about 6 inches wide or deep? Wondering how many of the embellishment pieces from the scrap rack would fit in the iris holder. I am not familiar. I will tell you once you um, are out the embellishment folders um, or the embellishment pages, they're pro they could probably get as thick as an inch thick, so I don't know if that helps you, but once they're really loaded up, um, you might see them as an inch, about an inch thick, so I hope that helps me out. Natalie says, love the idea of the scrap rack, but don't know if I have too much stuff. I don't have a scrap room and have to put things away in a closet. I also like to bring everything with me when I go for a weekend. I often share my stuff with other scrapbookers and therefore bring more than what I need just for myself or what I'm working on. If I were to use three or four extensions, would it still be easy to bring everything with me? Also, what is the maximum weight to use per system? So, Natalie, I'm going to switch back to the website here and show you a couple of pictures that will answer some other questions for other people as well. There's a couple of options. First of all, if you like to take a lot of stuff with you when you go, then a scrap rack is really kind of ideal because it's really easy to take what you what you need with you. So let me scroll down to the scrap rack at work or whatever it's called. There's a photo gallery there it is. So, um, so here's a couple of scrap racks that cropped in different events. 
But this is the picture that I wanted to show you, especially if you're already sort of using a closet system. So one of the nice things, this gal has taken all these binders and put them on shelves and labeled the edge of this binder. So you can, she's got one labeled, I don't know how clear your screen is, but the USA, Easter, Christmas, whatever it is. And so she just works with a single base unit. She lives in a small apartment. She doesn't have room to leave anything out. She works with a single base unit, and when she's ready to scrap, she sets up the base unit, and she's working on Easter. She pulls her Easter spinder and the color, the rainbow spinders that she needs or whatever, and she just works that way. So she's able to take just those um, things out of the closet and work with them. So if you had, I also know there's quite a few people who do this who have multiple base units. Um, now, if you're going to take a base unit with you to a cropper event, you need to have wings for it. So if you're linking base units together, only the first one is going to have the wings. So let's go back, I guess, here and um, see if I can find a picture here. Well, here I'll do this. Um, so only the first one is going to have wings. So when you look at this scrap rack basic with seven spiders, it has the two wings on the side. But the expansion bases, the next two pictures over, don't have the wings. They link together with sort of a Velcro wrap. You could easily take a base unit with you or two or whatever you wanted to take to a copper event. They fold totally flat. They're going to go into a crop, I mean into a tote and out the door to a crop. So um, let me see if I have a picture of that here also. Um, I guess that's one of the things that this little shorty version doesn't give us is the um, the Travel pack or rolling toe. Let's see what this is. Oh, that's a video. We don't want to do that. Sorry. Go down here. Um, dining room table. So, so this these pictures are a tote that's from Office Depot, and you can see in the one on the right side that all the spinders are standing up inside the tote. And then, and the scrap rack is in there too, it's just folded flat. And when you get to the crop, you take everything out of the tote, put the lid back on, set your base unit up on the lid, which is the picture on the left, and then you can put all your stuff on that single base unit right there on the tote, and you're not taking up any table space at the crop, essentially. So you have, you have all of your supplies, they're all organized, the same way they are at home, you set them up, it's on the lid of your tote, and you have a lot of space on the table to work. And the apron that's around the tote, this one's navy and black. Um, we make the apron, but the tote itself comes from um, Office Depot. So you can see there's what the scrap rack looks like on the back of the tote right there. So I want to bring up one other thing really quickly. It's a common question that people ask. Some people set their scrap rack up its back. And what that means is when you're looking at this scrap rack, you can see where the handle is pulled up on the tote. You see the solid black panel that says the scraprack.com. It's embossed on that. You, if you tip the scrap rack over, you can actually use that as the bottom, and then your scrap rack will still stand up and it'll still work, but it's at too steep of an angle, and that causes your pages to sag. So if you're looking at your scrap rack from the back and you see the hinges, you're not supposed to see the hinges. You're supposed to see that solid panel. So, um, so if you're having some page tag issues with your scrapbook, you might check to make sure that it's set up properly. Um, so I hope that answers your questions. Um, okay, and Kim says, Tiffany, thanks so much for continuing to do this and for letting us repeat the classes. I have a question about stamps. If we removed our wood-mounted stamps, how do we get them to stick to the acrylic blocks? The glue came off of the cling when I removed them, so I stopped until I can determine whether I ruined my wooden stamps. You did not ruin your wooden stamps, and I'm, I'm drawing a total blank on what the product is um, that you use now. Shoot, I just was talking about it with somebody at the Seattle show, actually. Um, no, you haven't ruined them. You're just going to use a double stick product. I can't remember what it's called, so I'm asking those of you who are listening right now, um, if you know what I'm talking about, you use on the red rubber stamps after you pull them off your your the blocks if you can type that in so bear with us Kim if I can't answer before the end of this session well I'll probably remember the minute we get off the line um, but if not we can put it up on Facebook but I, I suspect somebody here will know um, second question from Kim oh also do you have your stamp stored in binder in sections according to the size of the page yes I do and I think that probably she probably asked me this before I got to that um, indicating what number to look under the stamp. Just trying to make sure I'm getting it because I have a lot of stamps. 
Yes, that's exactly what I did. And there's details again on that learn page. Let me scroll up here. Um, I think there's some pretty detailed pictures. Go under the learn tab and then um, I think it might be called Sweet Stamp Organization. So yeah, so that talks about labeling the pages and making the catalog and actually how to go through the steps of doing that. So you want some, um, and that, that one particular just deals with the Sweet 16 page, but the ideas are exactly the same. So if you need more pictures or more kind of step-by-step -step on that, it's right there on the website as well. Nikki says, so are you a got a little or a got a lot? I am um, a got a little. I, I'm a pretty disciplined buyer. I wasn't always. Um, <laughs> I'm a disciplined buyer by force. But, you know, we do all these scrapbook shows every year, right? So every year I'm, I'm somewhere at somewhere between, you know, 10 and 14 events where I'm always seeing like the latest and greatest and there's all these wonderful demo people and I was constantly coming home with all this new stuff and, um, and I had lots of stuff and I wasn't really getting to use it because I was spending all my time on the road at scrapbook shows and working or whatever. It's kind of those, like that question is when the cobbler's kids are the last ones to get used or whatever. But I had so much stuff that I wasn't getting anything done except for myself home and spending all my crafting time organizing the new stuff that I bought. And so I listed the same policy in my craft room. I went, I had a triple base unit, and I said, this is, this is ridiculous. You're not getting anything done because you have too much stuff. And um, the department at the scrap rack doesn't like me telling this story, but it's true. I use more because I have less because it's easy for me to get to. So I just pared down to a double. I'm limited to the what I have, and I am a, if something comes in, something else goes out. So my purse box is constantly getting replenished. Um, with stuff, I do the same thing in my bedroom closet at home. If something comes in, I have a set number of hangers. If something comes in, something else has to go out. So um, now I, I can say all that. It is so very, very easy for me. I know um, it, there's all these levels of anxiety about getting rid of things, and um, I am way down at the bottom for ease of getting rid of rid of things. So. Um, it's been bad because a lot of times we get rid of stuff that I probably shouldn't get rid of. So, um, but I'm about a little. And I, I tend to use other people's stuff. I'm really good at using, I'm really good at taking advantage of my crafty friends that have, that are about a lot. And so I love you and the other about a little love you. So if you're a about a lot, don't give it up um, because we count on you to have the latest and greatest and the funnest and the coolest stuff when we're at an event together or when we're at each other's house. So, um, Freder says, I couldn't find the file that says the cricket cartridge images. Um, well, let's see. Let's pop over there and see if I can find it. So I'm going to go to Facebook here. Oops, it's the wrong Facebook tab. Oh, no. Where am I? I clicked on the wrong thing. Bear with me while I'm clicking randomly through the, web, the Internet. So I'm going to, while I'm looking for that, Freda, I'm going to go on and answer other questions. Um, Vicki says, I have a lot of stamps, so it will take a long time. It will take a long time. I'm not denying that. Um, and you should be prepared for that to know that this is not going to be a moment of instant gratification. But the nice thing about it is that you don't have to do all your stamps at once, right? So if you look at, like, Christmas is coming up, you're going to get Christmas cards, you're probably going to use Christmas stamps. So when you pull out those Christmas stamps that you might be using, go ahead and start that catalog sheet for Christmas with those stamps. You know, give them a number, start the drawer system or the shelf system by number, and put them away, and then they're done. And so every time you do a project with stamps, you catalog them and put them on the shelf or in the drawer, whatever. So remember, you just have to get me on that mindset that they have to beach stamps go together and birthday stamps go together. They don't have to go together anymore. So if you're using Christmas stamps, that's the first thing you're cataloging. You might have Christmas stamps that become 1 through 10, and then the next thing you work on is Mother's Day, and those stamps become 11 through 15, and then you're back to Christmas again, and now they're 16 through 20 or whatever. So don't, you got to kind of banish that from your brain about keeping stamps together by category, and you just want to get them into that catalog by category, and then on the shelf or in the drawer or whatever by numbers. So I'm going to change Facebook page here. We'll log back in. Oops. I'm typing difficulty. Uh-oh. All right, let's 
actually if we can't find that. Um, Summit says, can you repeat again where I can find the list of Cricut cartridges on Facebook? So here we are on Facebook, and I'm going to go to the 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group. So that's the first thing. They're, they're in the challenge group, and I haven't looked at them for a while. I'm going to click on, so in the, within the challenge group, it says About Events, Photos, and Files. So if you click on the Files tab, and there may be somebody on board that's a better um, Cutting machines, threads, and posts. So it could be there. I'm going to scroll down a minute here and see. Um, there's a link to getting to know your scrap rack. Link to Cricut Handbook, six page. So let's try that one and see what we get. Um, Media Fire, it's called. So let's see. Okay, so this is going to give you the 50 States Handbook. You file. We'll take a quick look to make sure we're all on the same page here. But if you just scroll down through that list, uh, this is taking a long time to post up here. Oh, I bet I put the do not show everything. Let's try another one. There we go. So there's so there's the 50 states. So you can print that out. And there's, um, like I said, and this one is six per page. So to get to there, again, you're just going to go, let me close this. Close up some screens here. So you're going to go to the 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group, click on the Files tab at the top, and then scroll down. And there's, it looks like there's a couple. So this one's called Cutting Machines, Thread Post, so that's it. There's a good chance there's something in there about Cricut as well. Um, there's some themes lists, and then the link to the Cricut Handbook, six per page. There's catalogs for different inks here, too. So if you're a um, link to Cricut settings, uh, last five Cricut cartridge organization docs. So there's a bunch of different ones in here. You just need to scroll through that files tab, and you'll find what you need, I think. And don't waste a bunch of time. If you can't find it, just ask somebody on Facebook. Just put up a post that says, hey, somebody connect me to the Cricut link, and then somebody will respond. I think we have over 3,000 members in that group now. So um, let's look, how many members do we have in our group for the Get Organized Challenge group now? Um, where is it, our little members tab? Oops, not clicking all around, finding all kinds of craziness. So there's a lot of members, so, and there's somebody up all the time, so someone can probably direct you as well. Freda says, I have, this, I have the storage preventer for my Cricut cartridges. I cut the image sample off the package and taped it to the back of the pages. That way I can have a quick look at the images for each cartridge. So a great idea to just take it off the back of the package. Um, Melanie says, sorry, I'm late. My husband took me out to dinner. I lost track of time. Well, we're happy to have you, Melanie. And we're recording everything. You can always go back and watch it on the boot camp page again. Teresa says, is there going to be a Black Friday sale? There is. Uh, Black Friday is free shipping day for scrap wrap. So if you have been waiting to purchase and you want to save all that money, it's a big, heavy product to ship. So it's free shipping day. It's from midnight um, Friday, so 12.01 a.m. till mid till midnight. It starts, especially, I, I'll be honest with you, it's actually 27 hours because we started at 9 o'clock Pacific time just because that's the start time on the East Coast at midnight. Does that make sense? So we can't. Our website doesn't allow us to stagger for time zones. So if you're on the Pacific Coast, you're going to get hours or more shopping time than people on the East Coast. So it starts at midnight Eastern, which is 9 Pacific on um, on Friday. So it's actually Thursday, I guess. And, and it's free shipping. And it's anywhere in the United States, including Canada. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Canada's not in the United States. Anywhere in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, anywhere that we can send a USPS uh, box. And in Canada, scraprack.ca, if any of you are on uh, Canada, our retailer in Canada, even though it's not Thanksgiving up there, is honoring the Black Friday sale as well. So, and that's just www.scraprack.ca. And um, so you, if you're not ordering from them currently, we have a big note up on the website um, that tells people. So when you try to order from us and you're in Canada, it says, hey, you might be able to save yourself some money on shipping by getting from Scraprack. CA, but I know they just placed a big order with us today and that got shipped out so they would have everything in stock, even the new totes. So if you're in Canada, um, they're going to honor the free shipping too. So yay for them. 
Janet says, what time of day is the January 15th challenge? It is going to be during the day um, again, but it'll be recorded as well and put up on the web. If you, that's, I think it's at 10 Pacific time. Um, we kind of rotate around back and forth, so that one's going to be during the day. Uh, Melanie says, hooray for organization. I made 40 Christmas cards this year in the same amount of time it took me to make 10 last year. Yay, Melanie, great job. Um, Rhonda says, mounting cushion. Hi, Tiffany, can't wait to get my scrap rack. Wondering if you have an update on the four in a row. Um, you know, we probably aren't going to have the four in a row back. We've left it up on the website to see what kind of feedback we got and how many requests we got for it. Um, and um, it really what isn't doing well in that sense of, of customer demand. However, we have the triple play, which is very similar to the four in a row. I don't know if you saw that, Rhonda. And um, there's also the option of using a hot tool to create your own four in a row. So if you're unfamiliar with how to do that with the hot tool, um, let's just pop on back to this is Let's see, I think that's in Cool Tools, the hot tool is. So you can customize any scrapbook page, any scrap rack page you want. So this is under Cool Tools, it's at the bottom of the page. It's called the Hot Craft Tool. You might already have one. There's a little video here about how to modify your pages. So if you wanted to create your own four in a row, you can use the double X and just run another um, line of you know, just hot melt it and cut another flap in it and you would have created your four in a row because I don't think it's going to be coming back. We do have new stuff coming in January though. So I will tell you the double-sided pages that were uh, brought up by um, our group, our new products group, or suggested by our new products group, the first two of those are going to be out in January. The vertical double is going to be out in January as well. And then we have another new page that's super cool, Woo! but I don't have it back yet so I can't see anything more than You'll just have to wait and see how super cool it is. Um, oh, uh, Wendy says um, the product that you use is called, and Lisa also, oh, there's a couple. So the question about unmounting your rubber stamp um, is a product called Aileen's Tack It Over and Over. And I'm going to type it in here and send it out. Aileen's Tack It, or, well, there's one thing that says it's called Over and Over. And one that says it's called again and again, so I don't know which it is. It's either over and over or again and again. So I'm going to send that to all of you. And then there's also Easy Mount, another one called Easy Mount. So um, for the question about remounting your um, stamps, you haven't read them, I'm going to send that to all. Easy Mount or Aileen's Tack It Again and Again or Tack It Over and Over. Um, Oh, Rhonda says stamp mounting cushion. That's it. That's it. Okay, so there's also something called stamp mounting cushion. Sandra says, I'm a Stampin' Up! demonstrator. We have a product called Clear Mount Cling Foam. That's the one that we were talking about at the show. So you can contact your local Stampin' Up! demonstrator, and it's called Clear, I'm going to send this out to Mount Cling Foam. Um, send to all. Um, so, and that's available, like I said, from your Stampin' Up! demonstrator. So you can contact her if you don't have one. I'm sure they're easy to find. Um, so, uh, Maria says, I'm slow. What Facebook page is that? Oh, then she says, oh, found it. So we're in good shape there. Um, Natalie says, will there be a sale at the Canadian site as well? So yes, there will be. Uh, Laverne says, do you have any idea when the paper storage boxes will be back? They will be back in January as well. So um, we have a huge order of product coming in in January. So we'll have the new pages and everything that, or I shouldn't say everything. I think the only thing that's actually out of stock right now are the paper storage boxes. There's a good chance that we will run out of a few other things as we get into the end of December. But we've got a big order coming in in um, January. So. Um, uh, Lori Ann says, is there any way to get a Black Friday rain check if what you want is out of stock? Um, I don't think there's anything out of stock, like I said, except for the paper storage boxes. So if that's something that you want, um, 
I'm sure we could do something. You might have to send me a reminder that says, you said we could do something. Usually what happens though, Lorianne, just so you know, is when something comes back from being out of stock, we put it on sale for the first week or we do a pre-order on it and then offer a discount there. So you're going to get, it's going to be kind of an even wash. So especially if you're on the list, if something's out of stock and you put a note in that says, and you use the notify me function, then you're definitely going to get an email that says, hey, this is back. Thanks for waiting. And it'll have a discount code with it when you're talking about scrap rack brand products. So um, yeah, so there'll be some sort of compensation. And if there's not, you can email me and say, hey, you said we could do something special because we're special. And I'm happy to honor that. I just might need a little reminder about it. If Joanna's on the line tonight, she'll remind me about it. So we'll be in good shape. Leanne says, for free shipping on Black Friday, is it only the scrap rack or if you're just ordering pages? Anything that's on our website. So anything that you order on our website, whether it's one pack of pages or whether it's the order collector kit, um, it's going to be free shipping for that 24-hour period. Um, Louise says, tack it over and over again. So, And Freda says, how do you clean rubber stamps before storing them? And so if you're, there are, there are different um, ink, like it looks like an ink pad that's for cleaning stamps, or you can use baby wipes. I'm not sure if that's if you're answering, if I'm answering the right, asking, if I'm answering the right question. I don't know if you're talking about cleaning the sticky stuff or um, just cleaning the ink off. So, um, and then some of them, so it just depends. And if you have a Stampin' Up! rep or a Close to My Heart rep, they're more than happy, I'm sure, to help you with that um, as well. I'm sure they have products, those two brands have products that would work well for that. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, let's see, Lori Ann says, so does that mean the brown and pink apron is not coming back? The brown and pink apron is not coming back. We're not doing, um, we still have the brown and pink travel packs in stock, um, but we're not, we're, we're not doing them. They're not part of next year's color scheme, so we will not have the brown and pink apron back. Um, now, there could be lots of you on the line right now, but I will tell you, um, Lorianne, if you want the brown and pink apron, <laughs> I'm going to write your name down here. So if you want the brown and pink apron, I know for a fact that there is one <laughs> on the shelf in the office that I saw today, and I said to Karen, I thought we were out of stock on these, and she said that one was in the warehouse, but there is one. So if you want to order that. Um, on Black Friday, Lori Ann, order some other color of apron. This is only for Lori Ann because she asked, ladies, I only have one black and pink apron. I probably shouldn't be doing rust in this. Um, put it in there on, on your order. Say, I don't want whatever color you have. I would like the black, the brown, one brown and pink one to me so I could have it. And there, I ho hopefully she hasn't given it to anybody else. So Lori says, I do want it. Well, you can have it. There's one left on your Black Friday order, and I will send Karen an email right now that says, Hey, the pink and brown apron has been promised to Lorian, so watch for her order. So, and I think that's it. I think we're at the end of questions today. Oh, wait a minute. Leanne says, uh, Sandra Lewis says, Stampin' Up uh, has a Stampin' Scrub, which is using stamps, and the Stampin' Miss Stamp Cleaner to go with it. So your Stampin' Up rep is going to have that for you, um, Freda. And then. Leanne says, what is the difference between the Sweet 16 and the embellishment pages? Does the Sweet 16 have flaps or each of the 16 on the page? So the embellishment page is a double-sided page. It's made out of a heavier fabric. Let's go back here. It should be easier to see a picture of it, I think. Let's go to pages. Um, they're they're double-sided. They're gusseted pockets. Uh, let's roll down here to it. So this is the embellishment page. Um, that each of the flaps has a little bit of a locking tab, but it's quite a bit thicker than like the Sweet 16. The Sweet 16 is what we call part of our base storage pages. So that's a single-sided page. It has flaps. They're not locking tabs. So the Sweet 16 is perfect for small little bit of size embellishments, the little $1 stamps. You get 10 of them for $12, so it's a little bit, costs a little bit less or costs a lot less than the embellishment page, actually. Um, so that's the Sweet 16, and then this is the embellishment storage page. So you get three of them for $32, but they're double-sided, and they come with a little Ziploc bag, and they hold a little more stuff because the, the pockets really pop out quite a bit more than on the Sweet 16. So heavy embellishments go with the embellishment page, small Ziploc bags embellishments, little stickers, little stamps, and that's in the Sweet 16. 
I hope that answers your question, Leah. Um, Rhonda says, how is the DVD included with my scrapbook order different from your videos on the web? Um, the DVD is a recorded version of a class I taught live. So it's very similar information. Some of the, it's a little bit older, so some of the products have changed. Things are different than they were. We're using different things and different techniques and whatever. So some of the information is a little bit dated in that respect. But the DVD does deal primarily with section system and how to go through this physical steps of getting organized. So it's a short condensed version of probably all the information you would get in the webinar challenge. Um, it's an hour, a little over an hour long, um, but it's the same in terms of basic content and, and instruction for how to get organized. Um, Andrea says, sorry, came in, came on late and we'll watch you play, but do you talk about the organizing Organizing ribbon in this other session. Yes, I talked about it in the last session. And um, so watch the embellishment, uh, the boot camp, the second one. We talked about it in that second one. There's probably also some information on the website too. But yes, it's definitely part of the embellishment um, session. If you're overwhelmed with ribbon, we can certainly help you. Uh, Maria says, great talk, thanks. Melanie says, stays on, has a clear, uh, has a cleaner spray also. Um, Leanne says, great, thank you for the info, thank you for the wonderful class, You're so welcome. Andrea Fibb says, thanks for the class, or thanks. So you're also welcome, I'm so glad you have spent some of your evenings with me. I know the holiday season gets kind of crazy and overwhelmed. Um, I am doing a little post on my blog about uh, called Tiny Tasks, Big Results, and it's just about little things you can do every day to make your holiday season a little bit less so you can stress less during the holiday season. So um, if you are unfamiliar with the blog, it's right here on the web page. It just says blog. And if you click on that, it'll take you right to the blog spot. And uh, today I just did a little post about different traditions and how important they are and sort of recognizing that just because you think everybody thinks that a tradition is important doesn't necessarily mean that it is. And we talked about making lists, and this is the thing about dumping your purse and organizing your receipts. So if you just scroll down through the blog, if you're looking for some little bit of tips and tricks about how to organize your holidays or, or be less stressed during the holidays, um, then there's some posts there on the blog that might help you. Um, so just lots of thank yous, and you're also welcome. I hope you all join me in January if you need a little booster shot for the Results Get Organized Challenge. Rhonda says, I guess once I get my scrap rack set up, I can use it my organized only space for things that can go right in there. Absolutely perfect organized only space. You'll be so excited. I'm excited for you, Rhonda. You are going to love it. So, and please post on the Facebook page when you get it. We love to hear and we love to see before and after pictures. I don't know what it is about girls, but we love it. Whether it's a home makeover, a personal makeover, or a scrap room makeover, we love to see how that's going. So please share with us. Um, Vicki says, thank you so much. I'll be doing a January challenge. Uh, Sandra says, I can't find on the website where the boot camp videos are. Can you show it quickly? Thanks. Yeah, well, I can show it quickly. It's just at, I think, if you just go www.organizationbootcamp, all one word, dot com, it will take you right there. Um, so www.organization, I'm going to send this to bootcamp.com. I can post it up on Facebook too, it's sent to all. So, uh, so I hope that helps, Sandra. I hope that makes sense. Okay, Melanie says, trying to talk my friend into joining us in January. Absolutely, yeah, invite your friends. Not only is January a great time to get organized, but when you have friends that are doing it with, it's inspiring and motivating for different reasons for different people. Um, some of it's accountability, some of it's just the social aspect of really enjoying doing something with other people. Some of it's a little bit of a competitiveness for some of us. So, um, yeah, invite friends to join you, whether they're far away or close. I think there's some gals um, right now, why am I drawing a blank? I want to say Sarah. Um, there's a group right now of like five gals who are going to somebody's house and watching it on the big screen. Um, every week and then um, going off and, and taking the challenge. Oh, I can't, I, I dried a blank on who, I think it's Sarah. I'm not sure. But if you're still, if she posted some pictures on the Facebook page of all of them watching on the big screen. So it's a lot more fun. It's always fun. 
All right, ladies, I'm going to hit my stop recording button and log off for this week. Thanks so much for joining me. I look forward to talking with you in January. It's not sooner. If you need help, email or post on Facebook or whatever. We're always here.